Good morning. We'll start something new this time that uh, you might be wondering which part of the Bible we'll be visiting. You know, I spent a lot of time talking from the minor prophets, and we will be in minor prophets again. I have selected one for our attention. It happens to be the shortest of the books in the Old Testament. So our sister Anne knows which one that is. Obadiah. Obadiah is where we are planning to put some attention. Now, I'm going to read a couple of verses from the book of Obadiah. But most of our time this morning will not be spent in that book. I thought it would be good for us to have a frame or a lens through which to look when we look more closely at the content that we find in the book of Obadiah. Now, when I say a lens or frame through which to look. I'm not saying that we should put on blinders or rose-colored glasses so that everything looks pretty or anything of that nature. But what I am suggesting is that when we look at the scripture, that we can just go to any portion of it that we select and we can look in and we can find much of great value and help to us. But one of the things that we want to remind ourselves of is that this book, I'm speaking specifically now about this one because this is where we are. This book of Obadiah has 21 verses. So that's not a lot of verses. But it is not a stand alone document. It is one of 66 books in our Bibles, all God-given, all God's word. So Obadiah fits in there somewhere. The message of Obadiah, I put a title here on my paper. It says Obadiah, a minor prophet with a major message. A minor prophet with a major message. You know why we call Obadiah a minor prophet? The same, it's the same reason that we call the others that are listed or that are called minor prophets. Minor prophets. And the reason has to do with the length of the material under that particular prophet. And so Obadiah being short as it is, We call it one of the minor prophets. And there are 11 other ones, so designated. I want us to notice in the first verse of Obadiah these words. Now, in the first line, it says, the vision of Obadiah. And then the next line says, thus says the Lord God concerning Edom, and I want to break the reading right there for now. We have a couple of things here. Obadiah is God's servant. He's God's instrument. He's doing God's bidding. And so what he's giving is not from himself. What he's given is from God, God. And if that would have been doubtful in just reading the first line, it can't be doubtful after reading the second, because the second explicitly says, the Lord, thus says the Lord, concerning Edom. And so that directs our focus immediately to let us know that what this prophet is talking about is Edom. I want to draw attention to one other 
verse or a part of a verse here also in Obadiah. And if I say Obadiah 1, 1, uh, Obadiah 1 to 8, Obadiah only has one section. But for my notes, the way I wrote it, it's easier for me just to say 1, 1, 1, 8, 1, 5, whatever, wherever I'm going, rather than just a single digit there. So if I say that, you'll know why I said it like that. But uh, in verse number 8, it says here, Will I not in that day, says the Lord, destroy, even destroy the wise men of Edom, and understanding from the mountains of Esau. Now you see two words there, Edom and Esau. Take note of that. Esau, the word, appears seven times in six verses in this, within these 21 verses here. And then uh, Obadiah. So Obadiah is focusing in on Edom, it says here. But Edom is a descendant of Esau. And so when we see references to Edom and Esau, we're really talking about the same, the line of descent uh, from Esau. And so that brings me to what I want to do. When we say that a prophecy or a section of scripture is sitting in a broad context, well, obviously we can't speak about everything in one session, right? And so we make a selection as to, well, how are we going to approach this? And that's a part you'll see now when I said a frame or a lens. So for our purposes here, I'm, I'm going to start by looking in the book of Genesis. G the book of Genesis is a good and a beginning place uh, for us here. We can see where Edom gets its start, the person through whom it comes uh, as, as a nation later on. But we're not going to stop there. I'm going to start with Genesis chapter 12. And there's a reason that I thought that would be a fitting place to start. Part of it having to do with some of what we read in Obadiah itself. But let us start there. Abraham, a key figure in God's program. We all know that who have been studying the Bible, that Abraham is a key figure in God's program, God's program, God's program. So why do I emphasize God's program? That might be more evident later as we look more closely at the content within the book of Obadiah. But God's program, Abraham, a key figure in God's program. Now let me begin to read. I'm going to read beginning at verse 1 in chapter 12 of Genesis. And then I'll read probably in at the first part of verse number 4. Here's what we find there. It says that, now the Lord has said to Abram, get out of your country and from your father's house to a land that I will show you and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. 
Hang on to that. Because when we say a frame and a reference, a lens by which to view Obadiah, God says here to Abraham regarding those who would descend out from him, he says, I will make those who bless you. I will bless those who bless you. That's a positive part. But he wasn't done. That's not all he had to say. Sometimes we just want to hear what we consider to be the positive. We don't want to hear the rest of it. But God's program is not that way. The other part of it says, and I will curse him who curses you. That, to me, sounds like a promise. And if it's a promise, and if God made it, you can count on it. And so God says, I will curse him who curses you. So anyone who's wise to follow will want to say, well, I'm not going to be one of them to, to curse God's people. In, this, in the context in which this was given, it should be understood. God has spoken. God has a program. It's his program. And it's not good for us to rise, and I'm saying us, I'm saying any people or peoples to rise above themselves and say, I, myself, rather than God himself. And so it says here, and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. I have said this many times, but it's really explicitly clear that God's program wasn't limited to merely blessing a people whom he raised up and began to call my people. It really wasn't, shall we say it this way to use some common expression, it really wasn't about them. And they learned that the hard way, that it really wasn't about them. It's God's program. That's what it's really all about, God's program. And so he says, but all the families of the earth will be blessed through them, all the families. That, to me, sounds very inclusive, very inclusive. Who's left out? Which family, which tribe, which nation, which, tri uh, which group of people is left out from the promises that God has promised that will come through Abraham? Who's left out? This text says there, aren't, there isn't anyone left out. God's program was designed to encompass the whole world, his whole creation. We're talking about the people of his creation. Of course, we know his program extends to the other aspects of his creation as well, but that's not where we are today. And so that's, this is, so I'm starting here in Abraham. And so what I'm saying is what I'm saying, we're gonna be looking at some of the details that are in the book of Obadiah. And when we do that, we want to have some other things in our frame and not just take it as an isolated book as if it stands alone and has a message apart from what else God has, has uh, to say. And that's why we're doing it this way. So in verse number four, it says these words. So Abraham departed as the Lord has spoken to him. And so that shows us a beginning. Abraham, a key figure in God's program. Now, Stephen, as we see him in Acts chapter 7, had those who stood up against him bringing false accusations and accusing him 
of all kinds of blasphemous activity. So they even responded to what they were saying. And in his response, he referenced what we just read. So we now haven't begun in Genesis. Now we're all the way through the New Testament in the book of Acts. And we haven't even begun to look in detail yet at the book of Obadiah. And one of the interesting things about Obadiah is the content we see there reaches beyond even the book of Acts and into the far future. So Obadiah is a minor prophet with a major message. But I want to read from Stephen's account and what he said. If I can get to it here without getting to the wrong chapter and starting to read there. Let me go to the correct chapter here. Here we are. So the accusations have been made against Stephen. And it says here, the high priest said, are these things so? And he said, brethren and fathers, listen. Boy, that's a great, that's a great expression. Listen. God is saying to us, listen. Listen. Then he says, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran and said to him, get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved him to this land in which you now dwell. And God gave him no inheritance in it. Note that. God gave him no inheritance in it, not even enough to set his foot on. But even when Abraham had no child, he promised to give it to him for a possession and to his descendants after them. Even when Abraham no, had no child, God already had a plan. He had a plan. In verse 6, but God spoke in this way, that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land. Now, note that. That's significant when we look more closely at some details in the book of Obadiah. But God has spoken this way, that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land, that's verse 6 again, and that they would bring them into bondage and repress them 400 years. And the nation to whom they will be in bondage, I will judge. God, uh, said God, and after that, they shall come out and serve me in this place. So they went into bondage. And that's really quite an interesting thing, that they went into bondage. Now, I'm going to turn back to the book of Genesis. And we're going to look a little bit in chapter 25. Stephen, in his time, was telling what happened. So he's, pro he's providing to them the historical context out of which they now were sitting. In Genesis chapter 25, when I was... In one stage of my preparation of these notes, I wrote something to this effect. That there was a gentleman whose wife was barren, and he was concerned about that. And 
he turned his face to God because of his barren wife's condition. And God answered. And that's what we're visiting here in chapter 25 in Genesis. I'm going to begin in verse 21. I'm sorry. Let me start at verse 20. You know, when we select verses, we know that we are selecting. We have to do that. Otherwise, we can't carry on this, this function, right? We have to select. And you might think a better place is a place to start, which is good. But for now, we'll start at verse 20. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, his wife. Isaac is the one I refer to as a gentleman. And Rebekah is the one that I refer to as a barren wife. She was the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Syrian. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his plea. And Rebekah, his wife, conceived. This is good news. Awesome. And then in verse 22, it says these words. But we have been taught that when we see such a word as this, that we want to pipe up a little bit and say, hmm, what's coming next? The man prayed for his barren wife. The Lord gave her fruit. And then we get the word but. But the children struggled together within her. Twins, two of them. And she said, if all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. Now this is good. When she was barren, it tells us that Isaac went to the Lord in Rebekah's behalf. And now Rebekah is with these twins, and they're struggling inside of her. And what does she do? She does the right thing, too. She goes to the Lord. She says, I don't understand what's going on, Lord. Can you help me here? So she went and acquired of the Lord. In verse 23, the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. That's quite interesting. Now, let me read on. So, when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over. So they call his name Esau, red, the red man. Now, remember, we're doing this because we're going to be focusing in on content in the book of Obadiah. So take note here. Afterward, his brother came out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. So the boys grew, and Esau was a skillful hunter a man of the field, but Jacob was a, wild, was a mild man dwelling in tents. And so we see something of a difference in the disposition of these men. Nothing here, though, would give us a clear, director, a, a clear idea of what their trajectories would be along moral lines. Not, nothing here gives us any indication. One man is, he's mild, he does things around the home, as it were. The other man was a man who liked to be outside. There's nothing inherently wrong with those. In verse 28, it says, Isaac loved Esau because of the aid of his game, but Rebekah loved 
Jacob. Now, that's really quite a thing. So now you do begin to see a distinction that each of the parents put a different uh, flavor to each guy, <laughs> if, if, that, if I can say it that way. And so now Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. So we know that there is a passing of years in the account. But it's given us what we need to know in order to understand what we need to understand. And so Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with some red stew, for I am weary. Therefore, his name was called Edom. That says the Lord. That, uh, that says the Lord God concerning Edom. Verse 31, I'm still in Genesis chapter 25. But Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. The birthright was important. Evidently, it was more important than what Esau, Edom, attributed to it at this particular point in his life. Because if he had had the proper view of it, he would say hunger cannot have a higher priority. But that's not our point for today. I'm just making that as a side note. In verse 31 it says, so Jacob asked about the selling of the birthright. And here's what Esau said, look, I'm about to die. So what is this birthright to me? So the idea is, I'm dying anyway, so what does it matter? Then Jacob said, swear to me, out of this day. So he swore to him. And he sold his birthright to Esau. Now we begin to see a divergence in these two men. And this Edom is the one that we're concerned about because we're on our way to the book of Obadiah to see what is recorded there regarding Edom. In verse 34 it says, And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank. He arose and he went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. That's a powerful statement. There's nothing else that could have been of such a wonderful, magnificent thing for him as a possession, and he despises it. So those two sons, one valued the birthright to such an extent that he was willing to go beyond proper measures to get it. So he despised his birthright. And there's another thing also that he did. You know, when Jacob, uh, when, when Isaac was failing and he wanted uh, stu uh, that stew from uh, Esau. And so Jacob and his mother put together a conspiracy so that they, so that Joseph could get the blessing that in ordinary arrangement would have been Esau's blessing. And it was the mom from the count who was the initiator of this because she heard what was happening and she, and she overheard. And she said, well, here's the plan. Here's what we're going to do. You're going to go in and you're gonna, I'm going to make this stew. You just go out and get the animal. I'll make this stew. I give it. You're going to take it in. You're, I'm going to put this on you. I'm going to have you present yourself as if you are Esau. And then you'll get a blessing. And so they did that. 
And then Esau came behind. And he couldn't have the blessing. And it troubled him. It troubled him greatly. So much so that I'm going to skip to verse, uh, to chapter 27 to speak about what was voiced after that. In chapter 27 of Genesis, verse 30, now it happened as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob. And Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, that Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. And so he had made what uh, Isaac was looking for. He was ready to serve it to him and, of course, to receive his blessing. But it was too late. It was too late. Isaac said, the blessing has already been given and it can't be retracted. It is as it is. And now in verse 40, actually, I'm sorry, verse 41. I'm still in Genesis chapter 27. So Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then I will kill my brother. So we see now that there's great distress in this man. So much so that his attitude, his heart, his intent is murder. Of course, murder would only deepen his problems. But it shows that he had a human nature, such as we have. And people commit murder all the time. And sometimes it's because they got angry about something. And they think they're settling odds but they're creating more problems. Now, we know that uh, as we were reading, that God said that Israel was going to go down into Egypt. They were going to spend a long time there, 400 years, but that they were going to be released. They were going to be delivered. God sent Moses in to be a deliverer for them. All of that comes. But before we get there, let me put this. Isaac, Jacob, Esau. So what did Jacob do? after that skirmish that we just read about, he got sent away to his mother's people to find a bride. It was going to be horror of horror for them. If, by chance, he should take a Canaanite wife, and they said, that must not be. And so he went, and they found a wife. And after his service, he's returning. And he's going to encounter Esau again. And Jacob now, obviously, is very concerned. He knew the attitude of the heart of his brother. He knew that his brother desired to kill him. He didn't know that maybe 14 years later, he might be still boiling over with anger and ready, be ready to kill him. So they went on their way. And they had a meeting, Jacob and Esau. And now I'm just going to pick up a little piece here. When they met, it was a, perf it, it was a, a peaceful meeting of the brothers. Esau did not exhibit the anger 
and the desire to murder Jacob. In fact, in verse uh, 9 of chapter 33 of Genesis, listen to what it says here. And you'll want to go back and read through this to get it all in its proper order. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. So now here's Esau. Jacob has offered all these good things to him. And Esau is saying, I have enough, my brother, his brother. That's good. And so also there, Esau then dwelt in Mount Seir, uh, which is Edom. And so the genealogy of Esau, the father of the Edomites, in Mount Seir, we see that in Genesis chapter 26. And it moves on from there. So now then, let's skip ahead to when Moses was leading the people out of Egypt. All these years later, these are descendants of Esau, Edomites. In Numbers chapter 20, I'm going to flip there quickly. Our time is almost over for this morning. But in Exodus chapter 20, beginning at verse 14, I said, it's numbers. Thanks for correcting me. Now, I do have, I did turn to the right place. I just said the wrong word. So I would have been reading the correct thing. But thank you. See, that's, the good thing about that is it tells the person at the pulpit that there's somebody listening. Not just hearing the words, but paying attention. And that's good. In verse 14, now Moses sent messengers from Kadesh to the king of Edom. Thus says your brother Israel, the word brother again, you know all the hardship that has befallen us. And so you know what we've been through. Now our fathers went down to Egypt. Our fathers went down to Egypt and we dwelt in Egypt a long time. The Egyptians afflicted us and our fathers when we cried out to the Lord, he heard our voice and sent the angel and brought us up out of Egypt. Now here we are in Kadesh, a city on the edge of your border. Please let us pass through your country. We will not pass through fields of vengeance, nor we will drink from wells. We will go along the king's highway. We will not turn aside to the right hand or to the left until we have passed through your territory. So he's saying, just let us pass through. We're not going to disturb anything of yours. We're not going to disrupt anything of what you are doing. Then Edom said to him, you shall not pass through my land. That's what he said. Lest I come out against you with a sword. So the children of Israel said to him, we will go by the highway and if I or my livestock drink of any of your water, then I will pay for it. Let me only pass through on foot, nothing more. Then he said, you shall not pass through. So Edom came out against them with many men and a strong hand. Thus, Edom refused to give Israel passage through his territory. So Israel turned away. Now, you talk about the beginning of troubles. And so now from here on, there's trouble between Edom and Israel. Trouble and trouble. And in the book of Obadiah, it tells us explicitly, not just in the book of Obadiah, other places too, but it tells us what the end of that trajectory was going to be. And to say it's not pretty is probably the unstatement of the century. But we're going to stop there for today. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you have privileged us with the opportunity to have 
the word of, of the living God and to have sufficient soundness of mind to be able to read and to consider what thus says the Lord. So help us, Lord, to, to benefit from these things for our own living in relation to the living God. Help us to honor you. We ask in the name of Christ our Savior with thanksgiving. Amen. Thank you very much. I appreciate your kind attention. We intend to come again next week and do more of the same.